Probably time to get going then. Uh, just quick question with your hands. Who was not at my talk yesterday? Okay, so good to know. Um, not too much duplication material because this is mu much more, actually let's just get going. What is this talk? Um, this is again, the first couple of slides, same as from yesterday, but I'll go through them quickly. Uh, this is my own personal vision of what I think we might be able to do with a new standard library should we start putting one in the namespace we reserved in C++ 17. So even though I'm a known active participant in the standards committee, this does not represent in any way, shape or form the current consensus of the library working group or the library evolution working group. Uh, nor does it necessarily represent those views of my employer, although I hope I'll be able to persuade them of a bunch of this. There's certainly interesting views on some of these design points. Um, and my goal with these talks is not to sell my vision is the one true vision, this is how we should proceed. It's I want to stir talk and produce consensus to find a vision. So I'm giving my, my idea, my inspiration, but the idea of tomorrow's talk is to pull all that together with some feedback and try and find out what vision comes out of this group of some of the premier library designers of the, in the world who strong commitment commu through the boost community and the like. These are the people who should really be, you are the people who should really be driving what this vision should be, I think. So that's my goal and hopefully we'll deliver on that tomorrow. So here's the format. We did the language features that I think we need to bake into the foundation of the language before we start creating the foundations of the library, which I hope we'll be moving forward within C++20. Uh, today we're then going to look at what can we do with a new library? What should we do with a new library? And throw out a few ideas. And then tomorrow I'm going to try and pull that together with more of a feedback session. And hopefully from that we can produce the basis of a document we can start proposing as a vision and di you know, suggested direction to the library working group with a paper for either Toronto or the meeting after. Actual output from the meeting, that's my goal. So the inspiration that set all this going was Going back about a decade, we started trying to apply the idea of concepts back then to um, the old, the existing standard library with the older version of concepts. And we kept running into problems. The more we tried to make the library source code compatible while using concepts with what had existed before, we came up with more and more fine-grained and detailed concepts that denuded the power of concepts as an abstraction in the library. We've got lots of very fussy little concepts all over the place, but no high level abstraction that brought you into the library. And we effectively used concepts to deprive concepts of their power by saying in great detail that it has the exactly, essentially the same behavior as it had before it was constrained. Which was, it didn't feel very helpful. And there was a notion that if you really want to do concepts in the library well, you might have to be prepared to take some breakage. And that's a hard thing to do in namespace STD and a much easier thing to do in a future namespace such as STD2. And by now, C++17, we finally got around to reserving that namespace and a bunch of others, STD followed by any sequence of digits, that is now reserved to the library working group for future standardization. So now is the time to start talking about what we think that library might look like. And I think that's why pretty much covers what I've already said. Hmm? So what you... Uh, the slide was not on it, so... Yes. Ah, oh, the slide was empty when it passed through, sorry. Okay. So, a um, couple of ideas for what STD2 should therefore contain. Um, got three different notions here, and I've heard different people express varying strengths of opinion in each of these directions. The one idea is it's just a complete replacement for namespace STD, but done right. Uh, so we learned a lot doing STD. We got some great ideas. You know, the containers and algorithms mostly work fantastic. But we've learned a bunch of things along the way. Perhaps VectorBool wasn't the best example. Um, ranges seem a bit more of a fundamental concept than iterators. So we've got a bunch of ideas of if we had a second go, we could do it better. So perhaps that's what we should be doing here. And then just almost slavishly putting our entire library, say, well, we know we've got roughly the right contents in the library, plus we need a lot more, but let's put the existing library into STD, apply concepts, and clean up the design while we're at it. 
Uh, another notion is that, yeah, maybe we want to do most of that, but let's not take adv the advantage to clean up the design while we're at it. Let's just make sure we do concepts right, you know, so we've got the new language features going in, but as far as possible, still try slavishly to be source compatible, just in a different namespace, with what came before. So it's a very easy transition for folks just to change STD to STD2 and keep on working. <coughs> And a third direction that has been proposed for me is STD2 is just an entirely new namespace with entirely new code going in there. Um, we've already got the vocabulary in STD. Like it or loathe it, it's there, that is our vocabulary. And forking vocabulary and having two ways of spelling string is not an ideal place to be. So maybe we're just stuck with STD but as we start designing new features and new idioms, perhaps STD2 is a good place to put them, so it's a clear perhaps these are using different idioms and different models to go forward, so it's perhaps a great place for the, ra place for the ranges TS, so it's not saddled with some of these strangers. That, and over, out overloading in the names and overload sets that you get with the STD algorithms, so it's a clean place we can do that kind of extension. And we keep STD and STD2 going forward. And that's one of the questions we're going to have to wrestle with, hopefully tomorrow. Trying to figure out you know, what is the scope and the scale that we envisage in STD2. And these are just the three most common ideas I've heard. There's other places on the spectrum and other whole different notions we can come with, but those are the main three I've heard. So my personal vision that's going to drive most of the rest of this talk is somewhere between it's a replacement and we don't want to break too much compatibility. Maybe. <laughs> um, if I'm applying concepts there, I'm already picking up some notion. So is StudMax entirely unconstrained, or am I constraining it to work only with object types, for example? And once I'm doing this, you know, I, I start narrowing down a bit more of the specification. It might be a time, as you say, to go with some of the ideas, like you know, if the two values are equivalent, you get the first one for min and the second one for max because there might be a, a ancillary data associated with the thing that you're using as the key for the min and max. So yeah, that would be a, an opportunity, and that's part of what we should be talking about tomorrow. But yeah, that's the heart of my struggle here. Another question comes with scheduling. How far out do we think STD2 is? There's the one view that says, we need concepts, we need them now, we need to push the library out now. STD2, if that's where our concepts are going, means we have to ship as much of STD2 as we can in C++20. No delay, because otherwise we're not giving people the, the product they're expecting. Another notion is C++20 is a great time to be baking the foundations of STD2, certainly get as many of the language features in as we can so that the foundations are built on the language foundations that we want. And then maybe C++23, it will have grown perhaps through the TS process sufficiently that we've then got a good solid coherent library that we can move forward and become STD2. And then there's the even longer version that says, when it's ready, we keep building it and building it until we know we've got enough maybe to be a complete replacement for STD before we actually publish it as a non-experimental namespace in the standard itself. So again, those are, yeah, my main three points on the scale of how urgent is it that we do this work and push ahead with STD2, which will be competing with work for continuing enhancement to the existing STD. Mm -hmm. And just porting the existing thousand pages of standard library specification, if we want to port the whole thing into an STD2 is a non-trivial exercise. <laughs> Even if you're trying to apply the new language features into STD without Moving it into SDD2, that's a similarly large task. I like that. Non-trivial exercise. <laughs> Several years of work. <laughs> no, I said non-trivial. <laughs> or just copy paste. <laughs> <laughs> so my own personal vision that I'll be is at the heart of my assumptions throughout the rest of the talk is we're going to try and get the language features right in C20. 
We'll continue building STD2 using the TS process, building on probably the ranges TS is a great place to start. And then try, as I said, landing in 23 feels like possibly an ambitious target for some, but a good target to be aiming at because we don't want this thing, we want to have a clear deadline that we're trying to move to. My expected direction that is probably going to fill Marshall with dread is what I suspect is going to happen unless some driving vision comes forward is landing ranges in C++20, there's already a huge amount of enthusiasm for that because it's baked, it's reviewed, it feels ready. And if we want that to be STD2, boom, we're already started on STD2 in C++20. Holding back ranges will be a hard sell. So I'm, I suspect that's actually going to move forward whether I want it to or not. And that's then going to establish our direction for how things move into C STD2. And there'll be a question of, do we stop ship and just port all the existing containers and algorithms and everything else across? Um, will there be time to stop and have a coherent view of how things move forward? Or will it be pick piecemeal as different people come up with, I've got a vision for how to move this particular component forward, and there's no coherent notion of how things move forward. That's what I'm trying to avoid happening by hopefully getting feedback tomorrow. So the main language drivers I see that make it useful to move to a whole new namespace and create a new library are essentially concepts, contracts, coroutines, and modules. These will really change our ability to create abstractions from the foundation levels up. And... Why did you leave out allocation? I know a lot of people don't like allocation. <laughs> <laughs> can, we, can we take out allocation and go back to where we were? So you, think al so you think allocators should be a language feature and not a library feature? I'm, I'm, no, I'm saying we should just remove them from the standard. Well, I'm talking about language drivers here. I got you. Okay. Now, if you want to talk about allocators as a language feature, actually, they're about an hour into this presentation. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> so, the thing I'm looking at here is concepts to constrain all our templates. Are we, do we want to mix and match with an unconstrained and a constrained world? I think once we embrace concepts, we really want to go all the way on them. Contracts, if we take them into the language and start using them to express the library, again, we will want to either enthusiastically use them everywhere or nowhere. Coroutines will really change the nature of how we can write asynchronous code. And I think a whole new asynchronous library that says we've got a great STD library that worked, it did whatever, but it had a series of shortcomings. We can do a much nicer job if we start clean again in STD2 with everything we learned from doing that. And likewise, modules is a way to distribute our libraries. Um, how far should we go applying these features in the existing STD? Because simply applying conversions using new language features on the existing library will churn a huge amount of library bandwidth. We probably don't want to be doing this twice. And if we are going to do it in STD, maybe we'll not need STD too. But everything I'm talking about is still relevant because you're just talking about doing it in STD. So, for example, if we wanted to use modules in the existing standard namespace, pardon me, sorry, too much soda, we could define a, a new small or large set of modules defining on what we think the right granularity is. That becomes our new standard library interface. Deprecate all the headers. And each header just becomes a single definition, becomes implementation as a single import, the, the module that now contains everything that used to be in that header. And suddenly we've got a whole modularized C17 library as well. Do we want to do this or not? Don't know. But if we start with modules in C++20, in SCD2, we don't need to have the header model for it to be trying to emulate. It can just be clean. Modulo C assert. Which again depends upon how, how much macros are part of our library interfaces. C assert is the classic example. Although with contracts, if we get that language feature, I'm much less concerned about C assert, although. We do need to point out that asserts are not the only case where it's important. The other one is logging. Logging is critical. But do we have logging in the existing standard library? No, we don't, and that's what I'm talking about here. This is very specific to the okay. standard library and not library features in general. I have to keep the focus. Okay. There's other things like there's, you know, size macros, math macros. Hmm. 
And there were general comments that there are other places other than CSERT that might have macros in the standard library, especially when you start looking at the interoperation with the C standard library, although we have wording that covers that mostly. But um, not everything in the existing C library might be able to be moved to modules if modules don't export macros. Still an open design question from yesterday. But we close enough. And again, those existing macros would remain in the header. So you still include the old header, it imports the module that has all the library functions, and oh, and here's all the macros you used to get through that header anyway. Question, can you have a module and include the header and not have it be a problem? Um, yeah, you've just been importing the module twice. I don't know whether it'd be allowed to. Question is, can we import the module and you include the header? Is it reasonable to import a module twice? Which would be, I'm asking Gore now. Or would Absolutely. The, yeah. As I mean, as you'd and it would just redundantly be, yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it, it kind of would have to be. Yeah. Well, no, because because you're not you, observation was it would have to be able to do that. But if we're using the module system now, you're no longer hash including the world because you're just importing a module, so you're not pasting in all those previous yeah, imports. But if, but if you if you were to import a module. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's and that, and, that, and that was that the point we're getting to here. Fine. Yeah, so and of course the other question we then get with modules looking for STD two and perhaps modularizing the existing standard library is what's the right granularity of a modular approach to the standard library? Do I want just one standard module that exports the whole world? I just have one import and I'm done. Do we want to break it up a bit more? Feature-wise, perhaps containers, algorithms, perhaps containers and algorithms together, concurrency over here, and just you know, I/O streams, and perhaps there'll be a benefit from slightly more structure in the module world. <laughs> but remember, modules are independent of namespaces, so that part of the organisation is an interesting thing we're going to have to hopefully just get some experience with and learn what works well for us. So the question is, what about ranges, which is out in the ranges TS at the moment, and certainly not an existing module, and how, how, how much effort would it be to put that into a module? I don't think it'd be any different putting any of the other existing library features into a module. It's just part of the set of features we're considering putting into the various modules. But if we say ranges goes on directly into STD2, and STD2 is a module library from the beginning, there might never be a ranges header in the standard. That might be because, again, this is just, I, I'm blathering here. I, I think the more direct answer is if it's not implemented with macros, it's pretty easy to make a module out of it. So the observation is if it's not implemented with macros, as, but fundamentally as part of the interface, um, it's very easy to make these things, whatever you're looking at, into a module. The question is, is it its own module or does it integrate with another module that ha would have to be shipped and packaged by your library vendor? Last so question. You said modules and namespaces are independent. Do you see modules as breaking up namespaces or vice versa? So the question is, if modules and namespaces are independent, do I see modules breaking up namespaces or vice versa? And right now I don't know because I don't have a sense of the granularity of modules we'll be applying. Uh, both could happen. But here we have a sense of the granularity of namespaces we'll be applying. And the observation is here we have a sense of the granularity of namespaces we'll be applying. It's a good point because I don't have, I should have put a slide on this in that even within STD we've been playing with more and more sub namespaces, not just relics but chrono and a, you know, a, a variety of these others, hmm? file system. And it might be as we move into a new STD2, we want to start out with a bit more organization about nested namespaces to package and break apart our libraries. That's another open question that we'll perhaps revisit tomorrow. I say no slide on that. That's when I kept meaning to put down. Thank you for reminding me. I forgot about seven times now to put that slide in. So another big language feature we know is going to have a big impact on the library is concepts. Probably the biggest feature that people are looking at at the moment. And this is where the big question comes of how much of a breaking change are we prepared to make as we port code into STD2? If we go with nice clean concepts, especially our know, higher level concepts, such as you know, 
regular types, for example, uh, that says these types have to have more than just the minimum set of syntax to get by with what compiled with the STD library. We're expecting additional semantics perhaps on these types beyond just the simple syntax. But once we have a good notion of vocabulary of concepts, it becomes much easier to reason about our code as we're using those abstractions. And perhaps sacrificing some of the corners that will fall off is the right way to go to get a simpler, easier model to work with. And the old STD library remains for people who want to play in those dirty corners, so we're not losing anything. But it might then make it harder to bring code from the old world into the new. And that question, I think, is going to be at the heart of how do we apply concepts to code we're bringing over from the STD namespace. And might be why we choose not to do that and just keep STD2 as a clean new namespace for interesting new extensions. And the other observation that comes here, of course, is that because we're talking about concepts, code is interoperable largely between these two namespaces because anything that's dealing with templates, you satisfy the requirements of those templates and it will just work. And concepts is doing some, something similar in the new namespace. It's not like we've got a class hierarchy where you have to have a common base class. Modulo a few slides ahead. For the majority of the library, code in the both namespaces should still interoperate because we're dealing at a template abstraction, a conceptual level rather than a strict structural binding. Can you say that last sentence again and give me the answer? What are we doing different now? Um, nothing. <laughs> what I'm saying is the nature of, because C++ code, when you're dealing with generic code, your, deal, your bindings are at a conceptual level rather than structural based upon strict class hierarchies. Do you mean name based as opposed to structural? I think that's what you meant. You Possibly. Mean, the the question is, do I mean name based versus structure based? That's what you meant. But I, I, I think that probably uh, yeah, similar reflects the, the intent. So some of my concerns are we, don't, we, we probably don't want to fork a vocabulary of concepts, have STD2 concepts, concepts and STD original concepts, especially if they start meaning subtly different things. We probably just want one common place for concepts to live. Um, what did I say here? Sorry, I'm running ahead of myself. So, but the idea is if we say STD2 gets the wonderful new world of concepts, we just put all the con concepts constrained stuff into STD2 and say STD1 was originally created without concepts and that continues to use unconstrained concepts. We still have the notion that there's an awful lot of STD1 is subtly using constraints today with the does not participate in overload resolution form to saying you'll constrain that code somehow. Now certainly we have freedom as library vendors to use concepts and requires clauses to satisfy that and implement those much more easily. But do we want to promote such constraints actually into the, into the library specification itself? And one of my notions here is it might be reasonable to do so if I limit those constraints say just using the type traits rather than the concepts vocabulary. Because if we try and nail down the concepts vocabulary to what we're constraining today, we might warp the concepts from what we actually want in a clean library approach. Bryce. Is there any data on the compile time costs of schema versus concepts? There's anecdotal evidence that the concepts is more efficient at compile time. Question was, is there any hard data about the co compile time cost of constraints and concepts to narrow your um, overload set versus using various finite tricks? I so the anecdotal evidence, I'm not aware of any hard data, is that concepts as was to be expected from the designer, more efficient. On the other hand, people have been doing, and you've been hearing all this week about people now actually benchmarking different techniques to do this with the existing C++ 17 machinery. So a lot of the experiments and measurements for the anecdotal exp experience with concepts was prior to people really optimizing their existing libraries to be super efficient with the existing uh, template machinery. So I'm getting a bit out of breath here. I sort of shouldn't have coming quite so quickly. Uh, next library fe language feature I think is going to have a big impact upon how we would be writing and specifying the library's contract. We've got a big opportunity here to move an awful lot of the library specification that we write in detail in the standard into the interface and plaster it all over the specification of our functions all the way through the library. 
And there's a real concern that if we start decorating our interfaces with every opportunity to use contracts, it can be hard to actually find out where in that signature is the bit of code you actually call because you're reading through all the different ensures and expects and if every function is now a small essay rather than just a succinct line, it becomes very hard to pick out what you're actually trying to interact with. So there's clearly a balancing act, I think, in here somewhere. Um, we don't yet have a good feel for that just because we don't have experience with that language feature yet. But it will have a big impact on folks like Marshall and myself who have to start writing specifications that get put into the standard. The way we actually render the standard, it's standard itself could be changing quite significantly with this and modules and a few other features coming through. John. So I did some investigation and there are people that would like not to have comments or contracts in their signatures anywhere in the header file because they want to look at many functions at once. And as soon as you start putting contracts or comments in the header file, you can no longer just look at just the functions. So they're complaining about them, just yeah. saying. So the observation is that Folks really do like to be able to look at their code and just see, at a glance, here's all the signatures I'm looking at. And the more documentation comments we put in, uh, the more we decorate with contracts and constraints and concepts, the harder it becomes to get a slice of the code viewed in front of you at once. And there's a counter argument for that that says, if I'm using a reasonably modern IDE, I can have a switch on the IDE that says, turn off all the, um, the glitz and just show me the code. You can, you, you can do whatever the IDE chooses to implement, and the IDE would know what it's looking for. But it will be, it could be, for those of us who still do code reviews in black and white on printed paper, it could become something of a concern. Um, I'm a dinosaur, I'm not yet with, I, I used to be in the IDE world, but I'm now used to moving Vim and I'm a, a real hack who's never learned the tools. <laughs> that, uh, the concern John has expressed is a real concern for me, but I'm also aware I'm a dinosaur. So, sorry John. <laughs> yeah, so observation is that there's various things we can do even to integrate with Vim to solve a lot of these issues, but I, I, I don't want to spend too much dwelling on this further, yeah. I just wanted to finish with a great win. No representation of code will give you both verbosity and succinctness at the same time. And sometimes you want one and other times the other. And that's why we have things like Doxygen and other better things. So yeah, perfect observation that sometimes you really do want a verbose view of your code that's giving you all this information. And sometimes you really do need the succinct view. and it's past the point where we can combine both of those into one tool, or the one tool with a lot of switches, maybe. So there's other tools, you know, Doxygen for rendering your documentation, I say IDEs that can filter these different views. Lots of ways moving forward because the world is a much richer place now for interacting with your code. I have one, I have one question. This is maybe very the last one. Very last one. Is it true that all correct programs behave the same way when the annotations of the interface are stored? So the question is, is it true that all correct programs behave the same way when the annotations and everything else is stripped? And by correct program in this case, I know John means you are feeding correct data and not violating those contracts. So within that position, yes, it's, it's true. But, but, and I'm moving on. Okay. So concerns we have once we start <coughs> using contract annotations in the library specification, we have to start saying, you know, do vendors have freedom to add their own annotations? If we choose certain things are important to put in the, the interface specification, and other things are more left to the vendor. Can the vendor promote, while well, I was reading that part of the specification, I'm going to promote it to an insurer or an expect rather than doing it as an assert in my implementation. Is that a freedom vendor should or should not have? Don't know. Mr. Vendor here. Um, I'm very much in favor of giving library implementers more freedom to experiment strengthening things that are not specified in the, in the standard because one of the, the prime things that the, the standards committee is supposed to do is they're supposed to standardize existing practice. And if people who write libraries, in particular standard library vendors, are not actually permitted to experiment, to try things out, to provide extensions, 
they're not going to be able to provide any existing practice. So the observation for the microphone is that for existing standard library vendors, they really appreciate having the freedom to put extensions such as stronger contracts into their interface that satisfy the existing contract so that we can gain the experience in order to standardize it. If library vendors don't have the freedom to do the experiment, we start moving much forward with much less confidence and much more theoretical aspirations. And it's always nice to ha ship existing experience. And the other big question that comes out of the contracts proposal we have is we've got the notion of a checking level. So I can have assertions on things that violate the complexity constraints of a function that I execute only in a stricter audit mode. And once we start having to deal with the notion of that checking level, does the library evolution and library working group in turn have to review every contract they put in and assign a checking level to it as well? And uh, the bad news is here, I believe, my initial view is absolutely not. That's not the business of the library to be dealing with this. And I don't have the vector example here, but it was um, Bjarne who really persuaded me of this. If we're going to try to use contracts as a replacement, for example, for vector at, I just put a clear contract onto the square bracket operator. And if I want it to throw, I install a handler that throws. Therefore, I no longer need this funny at thing. I can gain that behavior if, if I want by interacting with the contract machinery. But if I'm going to do that, I need to guarantee I know how to install handlers and make that check run, which means I need to know and have a guarantee about that checking level, about both turning it on and turning it off. So I think we do end up having to review these levels at the, um, the standard committee level which is really unfortunate. And I hope you can persuade me I'm wrong. John. I'm going to persuade you that you're wrong right now quickly. Mm -hmm. If you do that, you are putting the contract into the level of the assertion, which means it's not out of contract, which means you've blown the whole thing out of the water. This is nonsense. That's wrong. I will mm -hmm. prove it to you. That's wrong. Okay. So John's point is that if I start putting checking level into the contract, I'm fundamentally making the out-of-contract behavior contractual and part of the contract, so it's no longer out of contract, which ipso facto, I just contradicted the whole notion of the feature. Correct. So it really is a nonsense position to start from. Completely wrong. And we'll have this discussion possibly tomorrow. Okay. Among other discussions. Yes. So. I'm sure. So. <laughs> Moving past you know, the immediate impact of new, library fe new, new language features, time to start looking at the practicalities of trying to build a new library in a new namespace that's part of the C++ standard. So questions, can we, if we're going with option one, let's just create STD2 is a complete fundamental replacement for STD. Can I create a whole new replacement library in namespace STD2? Do we have problems with two top level STD and STD2 namespaces coexisting or do they play nicely together? And what happens if we try and import elements from one namespace into the other so I can at least consistently use one namespace <laughs> syntax by just aliasing rather than implementing things twice? And the key concern with compatibility is compiler ABI is a big deal. Something like initializer list, type info, the new operators, the <coughs> exception hierarchy for the exceptions that you're throwing and you're therefore catching, they're nailed down into namespace STD. You can't clone them into STD2. That's just fundamentally not going to work. But we could alias them if we did the type def route. And we have alias templates as well now. But that means there's a rump of namespace STD tied down to the language interaction that is not going away anytime soon or easily. And we can't ignore that as we start thinking about what we're going to do with STD2. We have to assume that's in our foundation. Can I continue? Yes. I think you might find answer for that in a few slides. Okay. Um, another big concern is ADL customization <coughs> points. Um, we have always using S namespace STD or using STD swap in order to gain access to STD swap. And then if we duplicate swap into STD2, and both of those STDs are 
using somehow, I've got an ambiguity. And I can resolve the ambiguity by explicitly qualifying the call, but doing so I disable ADL, which is the whole point for calling it that way. So fundamentally our ADL customization points can live in exactly one namespace. And that's a real design concern we have to bear in mind going forward. Uh, what about the proposal for better customization points? Please wait for my next slide. Um, so as it swap is our classic problem here. But um, there's a whole variety of things that have started moving in this direction. I named some of them on later slides. Uh, in fact, I named you know, the operator begin, end, get. The language cheats when it comes to the language needs these functions to be called via ADL, such as for range-based for or structured bindings, because the language says, I, as the compiler, am going to inject those names into an ADL lookup. So there is no injection from namespace STD to make that happen. Unfortunately, we as library vendors don't have that freedom. So potential ADL solutions. I don't have a good answer here, unfortunately. One is some new ADL control mechanism coming into the language. People have been trying to fix ADL for as long as we've known about ADL. Uh, I think the proposal, correct me if I'm wrong, that's currently going, doing a bit, getting a bit more traction on the uh, what ISO reflectors is you just never call the ADL customization point directly. You have a different function that's responsible for invoking for you through ADL that function. So free function ADL customization points continue to exist. You just write those in your own namespace and everything works, but they're not the same name as how you actually call that function unqualified. You'll go through a different function which lives in either STD, STD2, can live in both because now we can call it explicitly qualified and it's that function's job to do the ADL lookup on your behalf. And I was looking at, didn't get the time to put slides up on this properly, but the ranges TS using function objects manages to sidestep a number of the ADL issues. So that might be a way to go forward, just to reduce the number of ADL customization points that we need, or certainly how we implement them. Uh, but this comes down to We've now identified there's a bunch of core, a rump of STD that's not going away. And this is down at you know, the compiler support level largely, which is what essentially we call a freestanding implementation. That's the part of the standard library. It's special, it's in clause 18, if you, or now 21, if you read the standard. And it's kind of our demilitarized zone with the core folks. So these are the parts of the library that the compiler knows implicitly about and will call it for you. So let's just bundle all that into a single freestanding module, which I'm proposing to call core. And basically bundle into there the contents of all the freestanding headers. And we can do that <coughs> even in C++20, because it's going to be common between STD and STD2 anyway. And if STD2 is going to be a completely modular solution, we want this to be a module. So that just becomes an easy way of getting all the language support in one place. And of course, there's a few other things that aren't yet in the freestanding implementation that I think really belong in that freestanding module for these customization concerns. So things like decal valve, forward move, and swap are idiomatic in just how the language works. And we don't want to be cloning those into both namespaces. <coughs> it serves no real use. Uh, the tuple API is now integral to structured bindings even though it's not in the freestanding implementation. Because it lives in a variety of, you know, it's partly in utility for pair, it's in um, tuple for the tuple parts, it's even in array to an extent for specializations there. Uh, address of, in the, mem in the yeah, memory header, is a pretty fundamental, way. it's an important tool that now has to be provided as a compiler intrinsic because we need it to be const expert. And you can't implement that const expert using just the language features available to you. Equal to hash and less are the predicates that we customize in order to customize the behavior of the associative and the unordered containers. I put a question mark there though, because if we create different containers in STD2, would they use the same customization points? So there's a tension there. Iterator traits. Especially if I'm going to try and create something that works with 
the iterator notions, such as you know, the range-based for loop, I need to be able to create my iterators, and iterator traits are an important part of that. But is that going to be at odds with how we're thinking about ranges for the ranges TS? Will we want a better answer than the iterator traits we had for C++ 98 and beyond? Coming back to what Marshall mentioned earlier, we've got the begin, the end, all these other ADL customization points that are not used by the language but have since been injected into the library on kind of a piecemeal basis. And I'm afraid I don't understand where that direction's coming from, but there's more of it coming. Now, does that really belong in a lower level fundamental place because they're now ADL customization points? Do we want to do this better ADL customization lookup and be a bit more considered about how we're approaching those? It's a question that becomes more interesting once we're thinking the context of an additional namespace being around. A standard array is another type that is pretty low level and fundamental, but would we be doing a different kind of array in STD2? So that's my notion of what belongs in essentially what I would call a core module. And I would just suggest an additional restriction but the core module is going to be supplied by your compiler vendor because it's the library component of the compiler. Let's have a strict separation between what goes into the, fun, into the core module and the library that's built on top of it. And that way you're in a much better position to say, I can write a library that knows nothing about my compiler and you get more portability between different library vendors. Having the ability to plug in on top of the ABI parts are already always distributed with the compiler. But I'm not sure what putting a clear separation there would mean. But it's something to think about as we're doing this, I think. I think what you mean huh? by separation is libraries are allowed to depend on the core, but not vice versa. Essentially. Yeah. But essentially is there's the devil's in the details. I suspect that, uh, that you don't want all of the traits there. And so, so, a suggestion that we might not want all of type traits in there, although type traits is required for a freestanding implementation today. Which is kind of and it's a kind of it's currently our core vocabulary for constraining templates. I get that, but I'm not saying I'm not saying. I but it, yeah, I mean it's it's, saying, it's a I'm question. There's and, a lot of stuff in yeah. type traits. If I don't Why is it a problem? So what? Well, the observation is type traits is a huge. I guess the same mess. Mess is perhaps a little bit unfair, but it, there's a lot there and it's not all essential, but they're useful in different contexts. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we don't move, want to move all of that down right. that into fun. the fundamental or the core module. And that's why this is, I'm trying to find what the right vision should be. So thank you for the feedback. This is exactly <laughs> what, what I was hoping to hear. So looking ahead then to I said that. I was say, is that a small it's version? Five thousand a lot. I just <laughs> five thousand. It's a it's a big thing for a standard library. Is that without documentation? <laughs> yes. but, but it, but so the observations of type traits header is about five thousand lines of intense template metaprogramming without any documentation. But perhaps it's partly for for this case, type traits is open. It's going to continue to grow into the future until it dies. So the observation is that type traits as a library is likely to continue growing until the whole notion of traits programming dies. And I'm not sure how true that is because once we start using concepts, a lot of things that we're encoding as type traits today might be more naturally expressed in terms of concepts. Can you go for the hand at the back? And the other observation is once we have a good reflection facility, which I'm afraid I'm not clear will be happening in the C2023 era, although it's clearly making progress, I hope to gain much more confidence at the next meeting, um, that also addresses a lot of the same problems you're trying to address with type traits and hopefully more cleanly. John, last okay, question. Okay, I'd like to make an observation that if things like vocabulary do saturate, once you have enough names, you don't need new names all the time. You still use the old ones all the time, but you don't get new ones, so it will level off until it reaches an asymptote. It's not going to continue to grow and just be fine. So John's observation is 
vocabulary doesn't grow at a linear pace. You get a lot early, and then once you start using that vocabulary, the need to add things slows down greatly and eventually levels off, and we're possibly at that level already with typed rates. We're getting close to that. So with that, I'm going to move on to the next small section, which is, you know, niggles and nudges about how can we clean up if we're moving forward with, let's take the idea of cleaning up our existing library into STD2. It's our chance to fix all the sins of the past. So just some little ideas here. Do we really need both tuple and pair? First line shows a really easy way to implement something like pair if you want to keep the name. I don't, personally, I wouldn't want to keep the name, but depending on how easy you want the transition from STD to STD2 to be, assuming we're putting our vocabulary types, forking them into a constrained world in um, STD2. Um, on the other hand, if you really want to make that transition seamless, you might want to then specialize the template for tuple to actually have first and second members so that when you use the pair alias, you can still use first and second rather than having to fall back on the get API. So it's a spectrum depending upon what your view was for what belongs in namespace STD2. I don't, I don't think that can because of so the observation is we don't think that can happen because I can't do a compressed pair if I lose the empty base optimization. On the other hand, we could make that a constraint if we only create first and second if neither is empty, or if we want to keep the tuple compressed. So we can restrict it and move forward in different ways. It can be made to happen if we really want it to happen. I'm not suggesting it's a good idea, but I'm showing the spectrum. I'm going to go here and then here and then move on. So there's a notion that's going to depend on some serious language extensions that we've not got yet that we could provide a, a square bracket operator. Hana has it. We don't need it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but, but yeah. the point is dot first and dot second yeah. are there because get on zero is so annoying to type. No, I, I believe you, you got your history backwards. Mm. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the, okay, okay, fine. But <laughs> get is there because we didn't want to write dot template in generic code because a lot of people didn't understand that syntax. But yes, we can already access the pair elements using the tuple API. The whole reason for doing this would be to preserve the first and second naming if we wanted to do that, at which point exploring other syntaxes to even do the same is not helping because it's not serving the simple port porting module. I'd rather just lose the name pair because I don't think it brings value. But I said we have a spectrum here. Go. In the spirit of STD done right, hmm? Alex Ipana regretted mm -hmm. calling first and second mm -hmm. members of pair. He wished them to be X and Y. So, <laughs> so observation that first and second are really bad names for X and Y. So. That's that 24th and 25th? 47. <laughs> so that, that, that was a quick, you know, some of the niggles with pair. Uh, what can we learn from Vector? Vector bool had all sorts of interesting problems because we don't handle proxy iterators very well. So perhaps we just kill the whole notion of doing the optimization for bool and have a different type to do that in STD2. Yeah, which we have. Which we have proposals for on the way. No, we have dynamic fit set. Yeah. But we don't have it in the standard. And I don't think we even have it in a public TS yet. It's in boost. There's been a variety of dynamic bit sets around. I don't think we even have the proposal for Fundamentals 3 yet. I keep looking for someone to shepherd it. I was trying to do this around about a decade ago and ran out of time. I'm not sure anyone is actively working on that for standardization at the moment. Everyone thinks somebody else is doing it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, one of the things we can learn from Vector is don't drop the ball and assume somebody else is doing the job. <laughs> On the other hand, we're trying to get better support for proxy iterators and similar notions through the ranges TS. So maybe the vector bool optimization <laughs> wouldn't be an issue in the new. Anyway, so this is a, another thing to explore. We also have the concern that it's a vector with a different interface because we've got all these different operations of flipping and 
bitwise operation specific to that one instantiation of a vector that might look better if it was again coming from a clean name. But we don't have the problem in this case of something like um, shared pointer where you give it a different API when it uses that name, which is something I particularly dislike and I doubt I'm going to change anyone's view on in the near future. But if I've now got a shared pointer of an array, it doesn't have an operator star. It doesn't have an operator arrow. Instead, it's got an operator square bracket. So if I've got code taking a shared pointer of t, how I can interact with it means I need to know whether that t was an array or not, which is a really awkward thing to have you worrying about in my generic code. But we don't have that particular problem with vector bool. Um, one of the other things that looking just at this as a container in general, once we have ranges, and we have constructors taking ranges, do we need separate overloads for initializer list? Because <coughs> an initializer list is a range. And the range constructor should do the right thing given an initializer list. Can we simplify our sets of things we actually have to specify by just having a range constructor, assignment operator, whatever? Mm -hmm. an incomplete type space. But I think the, the third bullet on the page is the stronger. Um, because uh, when you when when the time comes to, to stamp out a constructor, the type has to be complete. You can't create an object, a container of incomplete type. You can only define it. No, it has to be complete at the point I do the instantiation, but right. not at the point of declaration. Right. So if I've got a list or a vector that has a struct that has a list or a vector of itself in it, yes. we require that in C17. That works. Yes, I know. For list and vector. List and vector are the only two places we, we demand it at the moment. But that conflicts with our ability to constrain the move constructor because the construct, move constructor needs to know if the element type is move constructible. But you don't, have, you, don't, you don't constrain the move constructor until you instantiate it. Well, but, but th this is very specific feedback we've had from the Microsoft folks trying to do this and saying, I can't do both of these at once, and the standard's already picked that we're going to have the incomplete type support. <coughs> and that. Which Microsoft folks? Uh, Billy, okay, good. specifically. Good. But I, I, and Stefan was backing him up. Yeah. I've been wrong before, but, but. this may be one time. It's when you try putting this finite constraint on the constructor itself, so to go into the overload, yeah. It's mm -hmm. I mean, you can, you can but that's instantiation that. time. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. And it's, in instantiation mm -hmm. time, everything has to be complete. Mm -hmm. But if so. it's this finite constraint, does it have to be, isn't it? It's instantiation mm -hmm. of declaration time. Mm -hmm. it, it, suffice to say, we, we have experience of this causing problems. And there's two, th once we have concepts and we really want to start be constraining things much more on the notion of move, things like our variant and optional types already rely on those constraints being there that they can sniff out if my thing's move constructible, I have this. If it's copy constructible, I have this other operation or I sphenite away. The notion of sphenite on a lot of our constructors and assignment operators is getting much more deeply ingrained into the standard library. So that might be something to re a decision to revisit when we look at STD2. It might be something we really need to struggle and ask the core, core folks, can you give us some support so we can do both? Because we don't know how to do it yet. Or we ask Marshall, because apparently we know how to do it. But <laughs> don't, don't want to put you on the spot. We'll pick that one up offline, because I want to hear what we might have missed. Or what I'm missing in my. Like I said, I'll talk to yeah. the and figure out what they're talking about. So. And, you know. One of the other things we want to look at is how we interact with deduction guides and concepts. I can't remember why I put that on. I was thinking something profound at the time, and it completely skips my mind while I'm looking at it now. But some of these lessons from Vector apply, uh, I say, the range constructors, the incomplete type support, will apply pretty consistently across a bunch of the containers. So rather than studying each container in certain, I just picked a Vector as an interesting one. The other container I think was worth picking apart a little bit was Map. So we've already talked about pair and tuple. We probably don't want to be baking those into um, the element type of the map. And we certainly don't want to be calling it pair if we want to be moving away from pair. Um, the iterator that I get when I traverse my associative container, it would be really nice if 
this became a projection or a proxy rather than having to know this pair tuple element type being baked into the data structure. And this would allow us then to separately store and have the keys and the values distinct, which means I can have a much more compact space, which is really handy for memory locality and a bunch of other things when I'm doing the search through the key, the, uh, the key space before I find the value which would be a pretty profound change of how we might implement these data structures. All sorts of interesting points to explore here and some real performance win, some real potential for some performance wins. And the other thing we can do from this is now because we're going to return proxies that return references to the keys and the elements, um, we no longer require the key to be physically const in the pair, which causes no end of crazy problems. We just provide a constant reference to view the key. We don't give you modifiable access to the key through the interface. But inside the data structure, it's just a regular type, which means we no longer have to launder every attempt to do interesting things with that, especially when we use the new API to extract and restore nodes. The default order that we use to order a map, it made sense to have standard less at the time, although the member comparator that may or may not be used is a much less interesting part of the structure. And that really doesn't belong being named. The, how the map does the ordering is the map's business. So there's a nested type there that we could probably just drop. The idea of the default order being operator less is not a great customization point. Because if I customize operator less or the less than um, predicate, I'm saying that any use of that type now has this less than property that I might not want to give that type. But it either has that or I can't use it by default with a map. So the idea of a default order is I have a separate customization point called default order and it defaults to being operator less than just like we have today. But it gives me a direct customization point to say I can tell you how my types order in general, but it's not mathematical. I've got a complex number. I don't want to give it operator less than, but I do want to be able to store it in a set. And the other thing we can do if we're now able to touch these customization, these uh, predicates is we have the diamond functors in C++ 14. They give us heterogeneous comparison. And you know, they're just regular types. Then you know, the template's in the function call operator, not on the type itself. It's just a simple, if we're having new predicates, let's do something like that. So that's my notion of you know, how we might clean up the associative containers. When you get to the unordered containers, we've got all sorts of interesting potential over restrictions on how the, hash can, the hashing works. And we might want to open up to different performance trade-offs. We might want to revisit some of the basic guarantees that we give on the unordered containers. Now there's, there's a lot of, um, Wrong way. There's been several papers about reworking the whole hash mechanism. Yeah. And in general, making it easier to, to hash mm. aggregates. Um, mm. And there are at least two mm. wildly distinct mm. viewpoints on that. Mm. So yes, there's been, uh, to repeat for the microphone, Marshall's observation, there's been a variety of papers about coming to the standard committee about how to do better hashing of types. And that wasn't my concern with the unordered containers, where the constraints we give on iterator and reference stability and so forth dictate how the hash result will be used in order to design the data structure and rule out certain kinds of hash table implementation. We might want to free that up a bit more as well. So one of my favorite topics, to what extent should we support evil types? Which means I've got to give, tell you what an evil type is. It's a type I just don't like, basically. And there's a lot of them. Because when you start trying to implement and test your standard library implementation for many corner cases, it's surprising how many awkward things come out of the woodwork and how much more complicated your implementation becomes, even for those common cases, because you've got to support the madness. Your test drivers spend 80% or more of their time testing things that you hope will never be run because corner cases compound. So perhaps we might want to be, especially for defining concepts for things that we can put in the containers, we might 
be a bit less cavalier about what we allow those concepts to support, just to simplify it. Not just our lives as the vendors, but anyone who's trying to implement something that follows a standard model is also going to have those same problems. And they don't have the experience of the standard library vendors to mess through all that ugly code. Common examples. Types that overload the address of operator. The standard allows that. Uh, Microsoft like to put their com pointers into containers, so we know it's a real deal. And it's not even the fact that the type is overloaded. We might be able to get away with supporting overloaded operator ampersand rather than the built-in one, as long as it always returns the true pointer of the same type to the object that was in there. But maybe you do some logging. It's interesting things when someone calls operator ampersand. As long as it doesn't lie, we might say that's what we're prepared to support. And that lets you just use the address operator in your library implementation and not worry about it anymore. Because calling standard address of on proxies and also ah, it, it escalates in awkward ways and it falls out of awkward interactions that you weren't looking ah, it's horrible. Um, overloading double ampersand and you know the at the uh, boolean and and or operators. As soon as you overload them, you've disabled short circuit evaluation. So as long as you've got library types that support predicates that return non-Boolean types that might be overloading these operators, which as a standard library vendor, you have to assume that's what someone's going to use as their predicate in their map. You can no longer simply use those operators in your code. You always have to explicitly cast every attempt to use a predicate or a Boolean in some way to a bool and do the operations in the bools, which is potentially needlessly noisy um, cast and overloads for the, for the optimizer that might disable the ability for the compiler to easily optimize something in line some of the code you're expecting. I'm surprised you have a question mark colon on this. Because we can't overload it. Observation that I don't have question mark colon on the list of abused operators. Um, but yeah, and and or are two operators that actually have special semantics in the language because of the short circuiting that other operators don't have. The other operator with special semantics is operator comma. So, I mean, which turns up surprisingly frequently if I might be using comma operators to sequence, you know, two increments of operators in a for loop. Um, this might be less of a problem after C17, in that if you overload the comma operator, I believe you still get the guaranteed sequencing in the 17 rules that we didn't have prior to that. But it still doesn't mean we want to support people doing crazy things and returning funny objects out of their comma operators. So I just want to stop worrying about these things and testing them. The very two smart people at Bloomberg mm. used the comma operator to implement metaprogramming because it was one that was mm. most frequently on the So an observation that at Bloomberg, we do have folks who've been abusing the comma operator to do fun things in our template metaprogramming that hopefully go away when we're no longer doing template metaprogramming in the concepts world. So I'm not worried about that use case. Okay. But it's there. Yes, there have been reasons to overload and abuse. And operator comma is an interesting one to overload because <laughs> every type's going to have it whether you want it or not. And very few people are stupid enough to overload it, so it's usually free for you to abuse. <laughs> We might want to introduce an abuse me operator just because people need operators to abuse in the future, but I, I don't want to go down that route. Other craziness that just trips you up in surprising ways. If the copy mover default constructors are explicit, it, it messes things up in strange ways. I mean, if I do a return expression in a function, that's going to through move version, it's testing different with the overload set it's going to build from just constructing from an R value. And these kinds of corner cases show these things up. And it's not that people should, shouldn't or couldn't write this code. Well, they shouldn't, but they can. Most people don't. It's more Machiavelli trying to, I'm going to give you a test case to screw your standard library. I don't want to worry about those people. I don't know of real motivating use cases for these things. And therefore, will not mind if I no longer support them. Explicit constructors in general kind of cause some problems, but we might, you know, we have to live with that because different syntax through the list initialization now. But that's a real problem for aggregates. 
because I can't emplace an aggregate in a container unless I provide an initializer for every single element or member. Um, arrays are similar because we don't use the curly brace initialization in the standard library. And aggregates support only that. So maybe we, at the moment we don't support aggregates, maybe we want to do something better to support them. And whether or not we need language support to make it easier or whether we just need to perhaps, you know, use concepts, have I got an aggregate or not, I can use a different initialization form. As Marshall says, we now have the use aggregate type rate in C++17, although some folks are really unhappy about that because it's now constraining ABIs in ways that they didn't have to worry about as compiler vendors when they were evolving the idea of aggregate. I think aggregates and pods have changed subtly in every version of C++ since 98. Mm -hmm. And you know, knowing what type might qualify is now an ABI breaking change if we change the rules on aggregates and the things are depending on that trait. People being particularly awkward, having a default constructor that has different behavior to a list initializer with an empty list. We know which of those constructors will get called, but if they're inconsistent, it's still going to be surprising. And this is just good design. I don't know if this impacts the library, but I don't want to be worrying about these kinds of things. Swap and move that throw are problematic in interesting ways. Especially for those of us who like allocators, because we want types that might throw on swap, which I'll be coming to later. <laughs> but this is particularly a problem if I look at something like unordered map, where I've got a hash predicate and, or a hash functor and an equal to predicate. And those are coupled. So if I'm now swapping two maps, two unordered maps, and the first of those swaps, fine, and the second one throws. I've now got these things in presumably valid but unspecified states, so they're still usable, apart from the fact they're no longer coupled and working together, which is the requirement of the unordered container. And I have no way to reestablish that. I can't undo the work. I might find if I try and assign back, I, the other one throws, and I really am lost. So the fact that just these are allowed to throw on these operations, when there's a couple constraints, we should just stop worrying about that and say, no, you can't do that is, in the new namespace. Which is what I think we did. No, For we've, we've ducked that question repeatedly. I mean, you can solve it in the current interface by just dynamically allocating those two together so you're swapping pointers, but now I've got an extra dynamic allocation I don't want. So the problem's soluble in so many awkward ways. Mm -hmm. And we, I think there's seven different proposed solutions on that issue, and we've not picked one yet. A quick list. Of throwing things can be problematic. So, I, yeah, I've, the observation is that maybe, you know, with um, less and a few other these other functors that are used specially by the standard, that if these things throw in certain places, it's problematic. I didn't want to make a list. I just wanted to say, in general, we don't care. We're not thinking about that question because for the people who do care about those, it's such a small corner, they can go and use namespace <laughs> STD. I want a clean, simple library I can teach without telling everyone about corner cases. Other types that have caused me problems over the years. Types with uh, constructors that swallow every other type. You know, a forwarding constructor that takes a single argument. Or that have a conversion operator that converts to anything. That produce interesting ambiguities all over the place. It's, yes, if you're giving me a problem type, don't be surprised if it hurts. I, um, when things like, you know, begin and end, the member functions and the free functions have different semantics, especially you know, swaps, another example, is, can have undue surprises. Volatile types in general are not very well tested as far as I can tell with most libraries, because you have to start putting volatile all the way through interesting places of your generic implementations to handle the volatile case. For a, it's a huge amount of work for a use case I don't think anyone does because I'm not aware of compiler, you know, library, standard library vendors having bug reports on these. So I, I think we could explicitly annoy we're just not going there. CV ref qualifiers on member functions of types I'm trying to store in containers. If I've got a contract that depends upon calling something, such as a functor has a function call operator, I don't want to worry too much about 
people doing funky things with CV and ref qualifiers on the function call operator of the predicate they give me. Unless they're in some coherent, consistent manner at least. And we just don't have any constraints in that space. It's far too wide open at the moment. References as data members can produce types that have interesting semantics. Uh, types with volatile members, even if the type itself isn't volatile, can have interesting semantics. So there's a bunch of these corner cases that if we're doing a new standard library, I'd just like to put those off to the side and say we, we're just not going to worry about those. Yes. I'm not saying all of those are good candidates for removal, but I'm just throwing ideas of if we're into the space, if we're prepared to limit our constraints, these are things we might think about. I'm running rapidly out of time, so one question. So. Would I include references in tuples <laughs> as being harmful? Because if I say yes, I've just killed Ty. Um, and a lot of projections. Yeah. And so all I'm saying is there's interesting problems that come up there and we might want to call out when we support them rather than support them unless we say otherwise. So quick example of where I was just last week stumbling over volatile having strange behavior. So we've got this structure that's got a wrapping of volatile x. I'm um, calling is convertible is the type if I call through this uh, wrapper convertible to itself. And for an int, an int is convertible to a, volat to a volatile int so that passes. If my embedded structure is a typical class type, I've not got a volatile qualified copy constructor so that type doesn't pass. But as soon as I give the perfectly forwarding constructor that now will find the volatile and it does pass again. And then we try the C style ellipsis and say, does it work? Try your vendor, they disagree. Uh, I, it, it's corners that I don't want, you start having to create the test cases to expose these to see how things are behaving. I just don't want to be in that space. It's taking productive time away from being usefully spent moving library forward in directions that people care about. And similarly a bunch of concerns on predicates. I'm gonna have to move forward because I'm running low on time. In fact, I'm very low on time. So a bunch of ideas for parts of the library that deserve, or we might consider for wholesale replacement rather than microsurgery. And this is where we really are treading into um, dangerous waters. A um, couple of basic ideas, you know, the concurrency library, especially a couple of slides on that. Some of the ideas coming out of the current concurrency working group suggest that maybe a clean new break in a new library would be the right way to go rather than faithfully reporting what we have. Text handling, I'm hopefully going to get to in the time available. IO streams is another area that we know is a widespread dissatisfaction that people just use a very loose surface of it and it's a big complex facility that nobody is really using the power of and are scared by. Was Valerie a successful experiment or do we just want to replace that idea with perhaps something better for that kind of intense math operation? And there's other parts of the library where you might, other people see different things they want to rip out and gut, but these strictly as yeah, broad high level concerns. Concurrency. Um, we have interesting concerns in the current library. Async is the only way to create futures that have some really unfortunate possibilities, but every time you see a future, you have to consider it might have come from async now. And this has poisoned the whole of the existing STD infrastructure to deal with concurrency. So this is the big thing. I would love to get away from by doing a clean par parallel concurrent API. Have we got the semantics of destructors? Do they join? Do they? Th and I think the consensus is that what the answer we have now is the wrong one, and we could do the right one, whatever that happens to be, in STD2. But at the heart of it, we've now got coming out of the concurrency working group the, the model of executors as how you control and manage launching and running parallel concurrent tasks for thread pools and a variety of other similar customization to manage that. So that should really be at the heart and foundation of how we would build such a library going forward. And yeah, and again, that we don't yet have a clean mapping of the ranges TS to the <coughs> parallel algorithms. That I'm sure is something that Bryce would be very keen to be. Yeah. <laughs> So opportunities we have a new parallel vocabulary there, 
We'd be constraining it with concepts from day one. And we would also have coroutines that would give a much cleaner syntax and working model to begin with. So it's designed for that. And have basically a clean new parallel library with everything we've learned. It will look similar in some ways, but fundamentally a clean new library for STD2. Text handling. Basic string is well known to be a mess. So fat interface has got way too many members. Um, it's parameterized on three distinct things that we may not want to be parameterizing on. Um, allocator, that I say see later. I really hope I have time to get to those slides. Um, char traits are very rarely customized. And character type, do we really need four fundamental string types to begin with? Um, admittedly, it's hard to lose char traits unless we also lose the ability to customize on character type. So we've got f at least four fundamental string types. And then we had string views, so actually we've got eight fundamental string types. And there's a big question in the evolution of STD is, which one of those gets the S uh, literal? Because fundamentally people want to think of string view as the primitive because it's not allocating, it's a much more efficient thing to be passing around and only go to the extra memory allocating a string if you do something more unusual. So it's kind of like the prefixes are the wrong way around in STD. The um, elephant in the room, of course, is Unicode. C++ 98 was baked at a really unfortunate time in that the rest of the world was about to discover Unicode and that became the common solution for localization, internationalization, and handling text in general. C++ still does not have a good solution here. If I'm in any other language, I've got a common pool of knowledge I can call on for how to handle corner cases and how these things are working that no longer depend upon my specific language and idiom. It would be really nice if our basic text type in the new library just assumed Unicode. And I would go further. I would say, and I'll, I changed, actually I changed my mind this morning as I was writing these slides. I'll not say what I was going to say that. I was going to say pick UTF-8 and just be done with it. Um, I think we can do something slightly better, but that's one possibility. Just pick, we want one encoding to be the native type of your string so it ceases to be a template at all. So my proposal is, rather than calling it string, which will confuse people with the existing vocabulary if it's so different, it's text, because fundamentally it's about storing and managing text. Simple classes, not templates. We can make these types immutable, because that seems to be a very successful strategy for handling large parts of text, and if you want to mo modify them, you can do that work by copying that to a buffer and handling them traditionally. It becomes composable like a rope, which is a much more efficient way for composing large bodies of text when you're doing a large amount of work. Um, my, no my notion is that rather than forcing UTF-8 encoding, we could do something like FilePath does. It's got a native encoding under the covers, but you don't need to know what it is. And then we can have APIs that can export as a specific encodings, but as long as you're not having to render as a specific encoding, you're just concatenating text and whatever, the encoding doesn't matter because that's all private and hidden from you. The only time the encoding matters is when you want to interact with the outside world. And you pay for the cost then if the encoding you need happens not to be the native one. And we could even have iterators that can iterate under the different encoding. You can go all sorts of crazy places. This is pure blue skies. Clearly, I have not tried to do this yet. But there's another, it feels like there's something cleaner there if we have the right folks to explore. I'm not that person. That's why I'm trying to get, see if anyone here does rise to the challenge. To let me know if there's anything useful that would work there. Ripple effect is, of course, that would then affect, and it's great with simplify the regex interface. Uh, IO streams, similarly. Although hopefully we could do something significantly different in IO streams that I have absolutely no slides on. There's, there's a huge can of, can of worms there when you, when you go to streams or file systems, where you have file systems who Different encodings on disk. Huge can of yep. worms there. So observation is a huge can of worms that I'm skating over there. And yes, I know I'm skating over it. It's not a quick, easy replacement. But my suggestion is, therefore, perhaps we don't want to rush into doing text handling in STDU by slavishly putting basic string in there. Let's give time to see if, perhaps not what I'm suggesting, but it feels like there is a cleaner solution than we have out there that is a much larger change than just saying, let's do something similar to what we have. Jeff, quickly. Your point about asynchronicity is relevant to IO as well. It's a huge problem in this library, as you're well aware, for any kind of output. Lousy management. 
So Jeff's point is my, my point on immutability and concurrency is increasingly relevant in the current world. And not to mention, you know, five vector, five virtual calls for one. Yeah. So the obvious problem is I'm not the person to write this because it's not my domain. I am not the expert. My biggest concern here is the experts that we really need are the folks who understand Unicode, and they have no real incentive to be C++ experts at the time. So it could be the community doesn't have the real person we need to find to push this forward. Although maybe we do have people who can talk to those people. Oh, I just don't know the right people. Just yeah, keep looking this way. Yes. No, no, no. <laughs> so, well, I'm not going to be able to do this in eight minutes, but I'm going to desperately give it a go. This is the real elephant in the room when we look at the containers, because nobody's happy with the complexity that comes from the current allocator model. If we go back to John's talk on Tuesday, why allocators? First performance, then performance, then performance, they really matter, and then there's additional capabilities so it's, we can do other things, but there's real performance benefits when allocators are tuned well. As I said, see John's talk on Tuesday. If you don't have a time machine, hopefully the video will be around sometime soon. Uh, interesting performance ideas for what we can do with utility. If we can plug in our own allocators, we can have logging, perhaps log logging if we violate some high thresholds. So in a long running system, we want to know as we're getting close to memory pressure and so forth. Instrumentation for different builds such as debugging, profiling, or test drivers. It's nice to be able to plug these things in. Complexity from the current STD solution is allocator traits are incredibly flexible. And that flexibility comes with a huge amount of complexity that shows itself up in the interface. Um, we've got al um, allocator spamming constructors. We almost essentially double the number of constructors to have the versions that do and don't have allocators in them. And we have to have some logic to dispatch beside when we're calling between them. Generic wrappers that don't need an allocator themselves like tuple still need to be aware of allocators so they can pass the allocators to their elements if the element wants the allocator. And then we get, it's when I've got a vector of tuples of strings and the vector says I'm using this allocator, so it wants its strings inside to use that allocator, so it's got to pass through the tuple to get to the string. And of course, we can't do that at all for standard array because it's an aggregate, so there is no interface to plug an array in. So that's just a lost case today. So missing features from the allocator API. There's no way guaranteed from the standard to query if I'm my types using an allocator, what allocator does it use? Um, I can ask, did you use this type of allocator using the uses allocator trait? But I can't ask, which allocator do you want? Because it, it's a, a template. It can't answer in that kind of abstract question so easily. Perhaps we might get there with the reflection API in the future, but that would be going back down a different realm of complexity, which is not where I want to go with this. And again, we don't have the guarantee for types that use allocators that I have the get allocator function that the standard containers happen to give, but it's not a mandated part of the concept as it were today. So my, again, highly speculative. This is, I really wish, wish I'd given myself more times to get to this because this is going to go back way too fast to be absorbed, but we want a much simpler allocator model. Allocator trait supports a wide variety of models. I think we need to pick one, and then allocator comes out of the type system. And if we're going to pick one, we need to pick the, the most reasonably flexible one we can find. And I think the model we have with polymorphic memory resources is pretty close to that. We plug in an allocator that's customizable at runtime through a traditional dynamic dispatch routine. But we want to do what we can while we're at it to still minimize the cost so you're not paying for what you don't need. So we've got to find a way to do this without injecting allocators into all our APIs and not storing them when we don't need them. It is a fun challenge. So my ideal model, no allocator in the interface. Um, the other model that we've learned that Bloomberg's really valuable is a data structure all uses the same allocator. That's how I get all my data structure comes from that one memory pool. So a container passes the allocator to its elements, all the element nodes and parts of a graph will all be using the same allocator. Just baking this into the model. It's a design decision that I'm comfortable with, but will be a hard sell in like 30 seconds. 
So my idea is that types are either allocator aware or they're not. So I've got an allocator aware class if I say it's allocator aware by some markup I'm going to come to. A type is also allocator aware if it's got an allocator aware base class, just like it's polymorphic if it's got a polymorphic base class. It gets funky because you also inherit allocator awareness in my model from your members. Uh, the key here is the cost of storing the allocator goes into, if I'm getting it from a base remember, they've already stored that allocator. It's going to be fundamentally an allocator pointer. So I don't need to store a copy. I just need the API that knows how to retrieve it. So I'm not at least, I'm reducing all to the duplication of allocator pointers all through the system. So it's not quite yet the perfect answer. But the idea is, at construction, we're going to stash an allocator pointer if the type is allocator aware, just like you build a V table. And I don't tell the system I need a V, it just knows. I don't have to pass funky V tables to my constructors. The system knows how to do that all the way through my hierarchy. But I, what I do need that I don't get with V tables today is a way to inject that allocator if I choose not to use the default. So that can't come through the constructor I'm going to need a new syntax to somehow inject this in parallel with the construction behavior. I do not need to set it. That's the, the other point is kind of like a V table. Once you've instilled it, it's stuck for life. Because if I can change it, I violate the constraint that the whole data structure uses the same allocator. Do not get to change the allocator. Because otherwise, I violate the constraint. Then you can just kiss, move, move. No, it's no, no. no, if the allocators are the same, they work. Yes, and if they're not? If they're not, I can't move. I get. So, so, if I'd had if I'd had my thirty minutes for this, I'd love to go into this. I don't even have thirty seconds. So, my notion here is allocator injection. We have a way to say. My type can have allocators injected, and I have a way to inject allocators. Uh, I'm going to jump through a lot of these slides because I'm running out of time. But this idea of property injection is not unique to allocators. There's a bunch of other ideas people have for things they would like to be able to inject into their type separate to the notion of construction that then become a property of that object. It's immutable. It doesn't change. So my rough notion would be something like this. You can spot the, the yellow parts of my funky new syntax. Class vector has an attribute that says it can inject allocators. So I've got using not aware tuple int. Tuple int is not an allocator aware type because tuple doesn't inject types and nor do any of its elements inject an allocator. So tuple, um, tuple int is not an allocator aware type. Tuple int and vector of int is. Because having a vector int element within that tuple, it's going to somehow inherit through the vector member the notion of allocator awareness. So it now has the ability for me to inject allocators when I construct those types. And I will need to have some trait, perhaps for generic code, to say, do I how to when to inject allocations? It could be that just I try and inject an allocator and it doesn't inject because the type doesn't support it. So how do I then inject the allocator? Um, at construction time, do I have a mouse cursor on there? Or just on my screen? Just on my screen. Um, I would again use an attribute to say, here's the allocator I want you to inject. And if I don't do that, you get the system default allocator, which is probably just going to call new and delete. And finally, if I want to dynamically allocate something, I need to pass the injected allocator to the new operator that can then inject it into the object that's being constructed in addition to constructing that object in memory that came from that allocator. And the end result is I don't store, end up storing allocator pointers speculatively for things that don't need them. As long as the API is, con is customizable, which is in the slides I skipped, something like optional. When the optional is disengaged, I need to store the allocator for when something is reconstructed there. But when something is in space in the optional, I don't want to be paying for that allocator. 
And if the type has space itself is allocatable, I know that that space is large enough to hold the allocator. So my optional object does not become any bigger for storing the allocator in this case. But I need to customize through, the tr through some traits to say this, I'm taking control of how you find and store that allocator. So there's lots of devil in the details. But the end result is I have interfaces that never at any point mention allocators. All that design problem goes mostly out of the committee and the library designers. The only time you need to worry about explicitly supporting allocator injection is if your type itself is going to perform dynamic allocation rather than composed out of types that perform dynamic allocation. So if I have a string member, I don't need to worry about it. If I'm going to allocate a string on the heap, I'm doing an allocation, I then need to worry and propagate that myself. So it greatly <coughs> eliminates a lot of the allocator spam and complexity that you see in the current STD model. I'm two minutes over, so we're going to be really quick on questions now. But yeah, I'll, I'll be done at that point. Thank you. Excellent question that I didn't have time to get to in the presentation. How do I address fancy pointers with this? Badly. I went with the option that I'm picking a single allocator model, and my allocator model cannot support fancy pointers because it's implemented in terms of regular runtime polymorphism. <laughs>